as soon as somebody realizes that there is no shame in whatever element that is about their sexuality, it helps them breathe easier, it helps them feel less alone, and I think that that is one of the biggest roles of a sex educator. Hello, and welcome to this episode of Sex, Human Rights, and CSA Prevention. Today we're talking to August McLaughlin, who is author of Girl Boner, host of Girl Boner Radio, and a sex educator. So today we're talking to August, and I'm going to jump right in. Uh, so comprehensive sex education, when should we start teaching it? How young is too young? I don't believe there is a too young in terms of talking to kids about sexuality. I think as soon as they ask questions, they deserve honest answers. And I think a lot of times when parents hear about sex positive parenting, they think that it will encourage children to act out sexually or have sex early, earlier than they quote unquote should, which really is not what research does. It's all about instilling of, of autonomy and confidence and inability to not feel shame about their, their body, about their sexuality, which starts with birth. I mean, we're sexual beings and sex is just a very small and important for many people part of that. So I think knowing that it should be age appropriate but that it should also be factual. Just say the, the simplest answer that you can, and if you don't know the answer, then say that and say, hey, let's look this up and we can learn together. So you covered a little bit of it there, but I wanted to ask you uh, what comprehensive sex education means to you. That's a great question. So as I'm sure you know, there are many states in the United States in which Sex education is not required to be scientifically accurate. It's not required to be medically accurate. So to me, comprehensive sex education is factual. It doesn't, it doesn't mean that you can't have values. <laughs> you know, we should all have a value system. Right. Um, and I think that's great. And I think it should leave room for that. But sex education should be as, as accurate and based in truth and science because it is a part of science that that is possible okay and so is intersectionality part of that what does that mean uh yes so you were asking about comprehensive sex education you can have comprehensive sex ed that is fact-based but it could also omit a lot and that is what tends to happen so one example is when we're talking about intercourse and we're talking about penis and vagina intercourse. That's what a lot of people define as sex. If you are a queer identifying person, if you fall in the LGBTQIA plus um, community on one of those spectrums, that is incredibly confusing and hurtful to learn that perhaps the type of, of sex that you're being taught is sex may not be something that you're interested in or even capable of having. So. That's just one of millions of examples, but I think we should be talking about intersectionality and privilege in all sex ed courses. Uh, what kind of sex education did you yourself receive before you became a sex educator? Do you feel like that was sufficient? <laughs> no. <laughs> no, if it was, I don't know that I would be doing what I do. Uh, I have asked hundreds of people what they learned about sex and sexuality growing up. It's, it's really the seed that planted everything for me was a lack of that. And so I'm really fascinated by both how little we learn and the wrong information we learn. For me personally, I had that really awkward class around fourth grade. Mm -hmm. And I was really excited because I, I always was really interested in like taboo subjects and sex was a very taboo subject in, in the world I was living in and still is for many people. And so I was sitting there all excited and curious and People were squirming and giggling, and oh my gosh, what are we going to talk about? And I remember learning a little bit about quote unquote male pleasure, meaning pleasure was a possibility for somebody with a penis. Mm -hmm. And I, when I heard that, first of all, I was completely stunned about this whole idea of an erection because I thought, <laughs> like that, I there was a medical drawing of it up on a one of those big boards, and I thought. That first of all, I'd never seen a penis before, and I thought 
what a cool thing for a body part to do. I wondered if it hurt. I, I was like, I had all these questions. And when the teacher alluded in this kind of vague way that it could feel good, in, a, in, in the context of like, just because it feels good doesn't mean you should blah, 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 mm-hmm. which was negative. But what I heard was, oh, feels good. So then I wondered what, a, what is going to feel good for me? What can feel good for a girl, for a woman, um, f- for somebody with a vulva is, is what I know now is what should have been taught. And, and we didn't learn anything about it for somebody like me or like a lot of people. And so I had this curiosity really burned into me very early on. And then years later, I went through an eating disorder and embracing my sexuality helped me heal from that. So really, the I think a more comprehensive sex education could have helped chip away at shame that led to so many problems in my life. Uh, talking about comprehensive sex ed, and of course, Prostasia is a child protection organization. So uh, what can comprehensive sex ed do to prevent child sexual abuse? Oh, so much, yes. When we have a sense of autonomy and confidence, or at least a lack of shame around our bodies, we move about in the world uh, in a way that we feel better able to protect ourselves. Comprehensive sex ed should talk about consent and boundaries, for example. Another really important piece is knowing what our anatomy is called. One thing that we know is that children who use terms like down there or they don't know the correct names for their genitalia, they might say, somebody touched me down there. Well, what does that mean? Does that mean their leg? Does that mean their penis? Does that mean inside their vagina? I mean, those are really important um, facts that that can make or break the way a case moves forward and whether somebody will talk to an adult. When somebody has shame about their genitalia, for example, they're probably not going to feel comfortable going to an adult and saying, somebody touched me where I feel so, you know, we have so much shame around it sometimes that we almost kind of pretend it doesn't exist. (laughs) Mm -hmm. So when somebody crosses a line and does something inappropriate or hurtful or abusive, we need to be able to have comfort around even the most basic language. Mm -hmm. And we know that when people do know the terms for their anatomy and they do have sex positive upbringing and education, they are better able to seek the help that they need. So you mentioned sex positivity. Is there a situation in which sex positivity is dangerous for minors? That's a great question too. I don't think it's ever dangerous. Sex positivity, the whole idea of it is to create equality, autonomy, and safety, in my opinion. When we have positive, healthy attitudes about sex and sexuality, which is not about going out and having as much sex as possible, Mm -hmm. if that's part of your own sex positivity and how you want to express yourself, that's great. But it also means accepting things like, I might be asexual, or, you know, I have a lower libido, or... Um, just feeling connected to this this part of ourselves. So again, because sex is is a small part of sexuality, when you think about that alone, that that tells me that we need sex positivity simply to live full, rich lives. Like it's, we would never say, oh, we should never be digestion positive. We should never be like neurologically positive like like because a brain can think dark thoughts Ooh, don't talk about the brain right Right. Uh, yeah so actually (laughs) sex positivity really creates a lot more safety for people of all ages so uh you kind of covered it which is awesome but getting a little bit more i guess specific about it assuming we're talking about situations that involve adults and consent is there any reason adult sexuality and pleasure should be a threat to children's safety Sexuality in and of itself is, is, I don't think, is ever a threat. I think sometimes there are sex-related aspects to things that are harmful, but that is not sex. So, for example, rape is not sex. And I think that's a really important piece that because we learn that it is, that it's about desire, when in fact it's about control and domination, excuse me, 
um, when we confuse those things, which is so easy to do in our culture, it's so, so damaging. I've heard from many people who say their first time having sex was rape. And, and first of all, if that is the language that is that is helpful to you or what you've learned, there's no shame in that because it's all we've learned, right? We learned that this is what sex is. If it happens to you, you have had sex. When in fact, sex is always consensual. Right. Okay. Uh, so as a sex educator, if a minor came to you with questions about sex, what would you tell them? Are there materials you would suggest for them? I would first of all thank them for their question because I think it's awesome when they when they ask questions. They ask wonderful questions, <laughs> really great questions. I've been really impressed by questions from teens in particular. They're pretty smart <laughs> and, and they challenge us as adults. Like, Sometimes they do ask a question, and you're like, "Oh wow, this is how do I go about this in a in a good way?" Uh, but what I what I do is I try to provide the most factual, simple answer, and I really avoid anything that might be confusing or you know more information than they're asking for because I think that's an easy leap to make. Oh, if somebody asks about blue balls, they're really saying they they want to do this, right? Like. Instead of saying that, just talk about the actual thing, and uh, and yeah, and again, just keep it keep it positive. And then also, yes, I think providing resources is great. I I really like Planned Parenthood. I think they provide really wonderful information that's comprehensive and respectful. And then sometimes it's important to find a source a resource that is specific to like their region if they're looking to go to an actual place for support. And I also try to make sure that. Any resource I share is inclusive. Uh, so, leading from there, what about questions about non-mainstream sex from minors? Kinks, fetishes, etc. Uh, chronophilias. Um, what would you tell them? What do you have to suggest to them? I think it's really important to, no to normalize what we consider very non-traditional, right? Like, we say conventional sex, conventional relationships, and and I can I use those terms too. Like I, I know what people mean by that, but when somebody's asking you, there's a good chance that they or someone they care about has desires or parts of their identity that don't match up with the mainstream, most commonly accepted and talked about style. So first to say things like, oh yeah, you know this this type of relationship you're talking about. There are many people who enjoy that, you know, to, to normalize it and not to say that it is, you know, the most common thing. Because, of course, you want to be you want to be honest and accurate. But just to say there's nothing wrong with a person who experiences that or with a person having a desire to engage in something like like a fetish. And a lot of times if someone's asking about a fetish, depending on how much they've learned, they may have a lot of misperceptions about that. They might think a fetish is just anything you like, <laughs> for example, which is common. We go, oh, I totally have a Doritos fetish or whatever, <laughs> like we throw it around. Um, but really a fetish is something that you need for arousal and for sexual pleasure. So talking about these things in ways that remove the stigma is so powerful, even if it's just one conversation you have with that person, it might change everything because as soon as somebody realizes that there is no shame in whatever element that is about their sexuality, it helps them breathe easier, it helps them feel less alone, and I think that that is one of the biggest roles of a sex educator. Cool. So, uh, speaking of being a sex educator, somebody who talks a lot about sex openly where people can see it. Uh, if any, what kind of blowback, harassment, etc. have you experienced talking and writing openly about sex? Do you have detractors? <laughs> mm, I love this topic. I, it's interesting. I, I had a good amount of naivete when I started writing about sex, but I was just so excited and passionate and I to me, as soon as I embraced my own sexuality, it felt very natural to talk about it, like talking about the weather. And I quickly realized that that is not the case for a lot of people. Right. <laughs> and I am from Minnesota. I'm from a community that 
is really caring and loving and also never really talked about sex and, and still is, it's fairly taboo. And so it shocked a lot of people when I, some pe people who are really close to me were like, oh, of course, yeah, it's a girl boner. You talk about this stuff all the time. Uh, acquaintances, some people were a little bit stunned. I was really pleased by how many people were positively responsive to it. I will say that I have I have types of privilege that allow me to talk more freely about sex and sexuality. And that is something I learned very quickly too. I because I'm um, I'm thin and I'm white and in some ways, have fit like the again this horrible word of conventionally attractive like some of the things about me people take it they would they feel more comfortable hearing it from me which is devastating to me um and it's also something that i feel a sense of responsibility to use well because when we have any type of of privilege it i think we are responsible to use that to help people who don't have the same kind. Um, I have had some pushback, you know, the occasional unsolicited dick pack, occasional comment, something about you're ruining, you're ruining women for men is one thing I have heard, which I could say a million things about right there. <laughs> uh, but, but overall it's been, it's been, positive and I have learned to really focus on the people who need the information and when when somebody makes a harsh comment or a rude comment you have to decide whether answering it in like a pl public medium if that will be helpful to other people who are seeing it I will do it if it's not then I just delete it or block it or ignore it and move on with my day I, I will tell you, though, that before my Girl Boner book, the first one came out, I took really rigorous self-defense classes. Wow. And that was important to me because I knew I was going to be traveling around often by myself. And people sometimes think, people often think, <laughs> that if you talk about sex, that you are inviting them to have sex with you. Or you are, you know, you're, because they didn't learn otherwise. And, and I have compassion for that. And it also does not excuse mm -hmm. horrendous behavior. As an out kinky um, person, I get that. <laughs> exactly. It's so similar, right? Oh, you like kink? You must want to do X, Y, and Z with right. me. I'm coming exactly. over. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's exactly that. So it was important to me. And and when I've talked about self-defense before, some people wonder if that's – it wasn't about learning to be violent, I've heard that comment before. Like, shouldn't we just say they should stop attacking? Of course, people should stop attacking people. <laughs> uh, regardless, it is such an incredible experience. If you take a consent-focused, prevention-focused self-defense class, I you learn so much about your body and your own strength and ability. And I realized how many messages I have absorbed about what it means to be a woman, what it means to be smaller than somebody else. Um, the whole idea of we have to be nice all the time. Mm -hmm. It absolutely changed my life in a very empowering ways. And I'm so grateful I took it. I'm also grateful that knock on wood, I haven't needed to use like the biggest moves. <laughs> uh, but I have used some, you know, just using your voice and practicing that muscle memory of no is like really powerful. So yeah, it's, it's definitely a safety and privacy and all of these issues have to be a part of my priority list. That's just something that I have to do as, as a sex educator and, and as somebody who talks openly about sex. It's an interesting position to be in, isn't it? it is. Yeah. I'm sure you have many stories yourself. <laughs> I have a few. <laughs> um, so I want to circle back to something you mentioned earlier. You mentioned anorexia, and as a fellow eating disorder sufferer, I like to ask questions about where these things intersect when I can. Uh, so in your book, you talk about battling anorexia and how you got there when you were younger. Was it trauma-related? You mentioned that sex ed would have helped. Do you think there's any other, like, uh, or more specifically maybe what would have helped you uh, to avoid your eating disorder? Yeah, thank you for that question. I think most eating disorders have a trauma element to them, some type. 
because we don't go to those lengths of self-harm if we aren't feeling something traumatic. And then the disorder itself becomes a trauma, which is a really complicated mess, <laughs> as, you, as you know, if you've gone through this too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, yes. Layers of, of things contributed to mine. One was undiagnosed ADHD. Mm. It was a very big factor, and I consider that a trauma in my life to not know why my brain works differently and to feel like an alien in the world. Um, there are so many aspects of that that once I finally was diagnosed, which wasn't until age 30, oh, wow. um, yeah, it's looking back, I just, I had to kind of grieve some of the experiences and times and hardships that I had that might not have happened otherwise. Uh, so that's a big piece. There is this history in my family of, of sexual abuse. And while I was not molested myself, the trickle down effect was very real. Mm -hmm. And that's something that we don't hear a lot about is like the intergenerational impact of sexual abuse. Um, my mother was abused, other women in my family. And when you learn at a young age that that has happened at the hands and to people that you love, that is traumatic as well. So I think it was a combination of things. And then the trauma, I think it's also traumatic to grow up in a society that places so much emphasis on for women and femmes to be thin, to be curvy, but only in certain places, to that that is where our value derives from. So when you have low self-esteem, which when you have undiagnosed ADHD, and even when you have it diagnosed a lot of times, it really, really affects your self-esteem. So you're much more vulnerable to the effects of things like that. So it was, it was multi-layered. And the way that I realized that sex ed would have been helpful was that I was sitting in a college class during my eating disorder treatment I was doing like inpatient and appointments and stuff. And in between the, those, I decided to take some college courses. I was taking this women's psychology class and we were talking about sex one day. The professor started this whole conversation, like we're gonna talk about sex. And I had one of those huge light bulb moments of realizing that while I had been sexually active, I was sexually active at that time in my life and pleasurably so, mm -hmm. I had never talked about it. Like I didn't talk about sex with the person I was having it with. It was this taboo, shrouded in shame topic that I had never even looked at. And I started to, for the first time, get angry about the messaging that I had received and the things I did not, I did not know where my clitoris was at that point. Oh, no. I, <laughs> I remember, I mean, I didn't really, I knew where, where, where felt good, but I didn't know exactly. I couldn't have said, oh, and point to it. And there was this moment where the teacher said, there are some women, she was using very, you know, heteronormative terms, but some women do not even know where their clitoris is. And she looked at me and I went like, oh, that's, you know, terrible. And inside I'm like, wait a minute, my, my clitor, clitor, clitoris, okay, this sounds familiar. Like I didn't know. And so thankfully it's, it's that term has become more mainstream. We see it in Cosmo and stuff more often, but it's new in our texts. Like our, it was literally snipped out of medical texts historically. Wow. We didn't know where it was. We didn't know it had this full um, shape internally until like the 90s, mm -hmm. which I was in high school in the 90s. So, so yeah, a lot of people don't know and, and can't find it on an anatomical drawing. So I realized later that that was the moment I stopped wanting to starve myself. It was the moment I stopped wanting to hurt the body that I was no longer going to disrespect. It still took years to move past it fully as it tends to, but that I believe it saved my life. Well, thank you very much for talking about that. I know that's a tough subject to talk about, and so I really appreciate your answers and your your process there. And so mm -hmm. going from there, I always like to talk about self-care when I can. And so let's talk about, like, in a world where people harass you for sharing uh, facts about sex and stuff like that and what you've been through, things like that, what does self-care look like for you when it gets to be too much? Mm, I love this question. And you're so right. Self-care needs to be part of that same conversation about self-protection and bullying and harassment. I really cherish my boundaries. <laughs> um, 
one part of my self-care is not working in the evenings. I have found that I'm a morning person, I'm a daytime person, and I need to have time to not be locked into my computer. My brain doesn't work as well then anyway, so it doesn't really help. And prioritizing healthy sleep habits, which even now, every time I talk about sleep in a positive way, it kind of like shocks my inner child because I, <laughs> it took me forever to learn how to sleep well, <laughs> forever. Yes, yeah, so I can finally sleep, so I cherish that. Nice. Yeah, um, I do embrace solo play and masturbation as self-care. I think that's really, really important. It's been important for me since I was a quote-unquote late bloomer in that department. I don't think there's really any, there's no late. I just know that there were many barriers for me, so I didn't, I didn't delve into that for years and years. And so now it's, it's so much about pleasure and stress relief and comfort and completely changing your mindset. <laughs> uh, I, I really embrace that. And then animals are so important to me. I have, you may have heard, <laughs> I have a pit bull and, uh, and a bird. And they are my coworkers, and they bring me a lot of peace. My cats work with me, so I get it. <laughs> oh, how many do you have? I have two. Oh, sweet. Cats are amazing. Aren't they? They're awesome. Uh, smart. So, so that's about our time. Uh, I did want to see, like, if you could distill everything down into, like, one statement. What's the most important to you? Uh, what do we need to cover in sex ed? I know it's a big question, but yeah. but like if you could s distill it down to like, this is what I would say to you if I only had a few minutes to talk to you. <laughs> start where you are. I think start where you are is very important because when we start peeling back the layers of shame, we feel shame about not knowing it sooner. <laughs> like that's really <laughs> common. So I think starting where we are is important. Embracing our own pleasure is vital, whether that is specific to sex or not. Making time in our lives for pleasure. It is rebellion. It is self-care. It is essential. It's like a nutrient. Like, I think we need pleasure. Um, and just knowing that even when you believe that there's something wrong with you, there's not. You are, you are awesome. You are beautiful. And you are sexy. And you are... You are, you are as close to perfect as anything can be. Um, and I'm, I'm so sorry that the world ever tells you anything different. Uh, so, like I said, that's our time. Uh, I wanted to thank August for talking to us today. <laughs> awesome. Thank you, Megan. That was really fun. Thanks for tuning in to this episode of Sex, Human Rights, and CSA Prevention. Don't miss out. Click to subscribe. And don't forget to donate to support our work. Bye. Bye.